It's a great honor to be here, all the way from the UK. I've got my uh, Carnival of Curiosity trousers on for you as well. So uh, <laughs> I'm here to tell you my story. Like many of us, I was a creative child. I announced one day I wanted to be an artist, although the way I became one was totally unplanned. I was a bored student, picking up a digital camera for the first time and photographing myself, pre-selfie generation. Back then, I actually felt pretty odd. But uh, when I saw that self-portraiture was a valid genre in art history, I was led by my curiosity. The digital camera, together with Photoshop and the internet, was like a trinity modern phenomenon that, for me, at a time of depression, became my distraction, a channel of expression, playful pictures of myself multiplied, shared to the world under an alter ego made for my middle name, Miss Aniela, was born. I met my partner, Matthew, a former photographer whose interest I reawakened into a renaissance with a camera, starting out as my recruited human tripod. His participation in my hobby grew increasingly. It was all minimalist, simple, no fancy equipment or lights, but in hindsight, there were certain key interests evident right from the start. Our love for places, never a studio, femininity, starting with framing mine, and surrealism, stepping away from the reality. Desire for a better world? I'd adorn the frame with the only model I had, myself, dancing, posing, childlike, or a layered image to create an illusion of floating, flying, falling. I was experiencing anxiety in my life, and it seemed to fuel my desire to create. Local fame led to national and international exhibition in my hometown, Brighton, then Madrid, Chicago, Buenos Aires, and being flown to speak for Microsoft in Seattle once and then more led to swiftly dumping my first nine to five. Self-employed artist at 21, then came two published books on photography. From bored students, I was Flickr star, gracing the cover of American Photo. Self-gazing was a rich six years of work, a body of work all made from my own. But I was also concerned by the meaning of it, by a sense of success I felt was false, one hit, one dimensional, niche and esoteric pictures of myself weren't taking me to where I wanted to be. And whilst my online audience begged to armchair gaze more self-portraits, I was desperate to diversify. Desperate to turn the lens onto other subjects, into the most obvious currency for my aesthetics, fashion. Occupying one side of the lens unlocked the door to different lenses and gear, lighting, and the world of styling teams, costume, makeup, and wigs. More possibilities came forth, but also a circus. Less autonomy, not me and my own little world anymore. In a Seattle ballroom with a hand-painted mural, a redhead model adorned in voluminous powder blue, a vision I couldn't serve solo, but needed the hand of designers, stylists, a multi-light setup, camera tethered to computer to check every pixel, a new meticulous operation, and then in Photoshop, a vision, a fusion with the ocean, a photograph I'd shot at the Big Sur, diligently warped into the folds of her skirt to become indoors meets outdoors, human meets nature. My my minimalism had become sophistication. And by this time, Matt and I were directors of our own business, Miss Aniela Limited, making a living from print, supplemented by workshops, sponsorships from Nikon, Broncolor, Manfrotto, and more followed. Fashion photographer became my next label, just as I was finding that label not quite right, a sector I felt needed specific passion for fashion, for labels, for garments, and not only that, but I didn't care as much for a disposable story over a sequence of magazine pages than for the same way I'd always created, a story in one frame. And in defiance of the cool modernity that strobe lighting was giving me, grey cards and correct colour balance, I wanted something else, old, warm, special. In a stately location, my attention wandered from the wires to the paintings on the walls. An 18th century painting of stormy ships caught my eye. I photographed it, not knowing why, and later found myself transplanting it over the model, archaic sailors falling in around a golden Helen of Troy as she bit her string of pearls and spelled their rescue or demise. With mask and arrays, trial and error, two pieces centuries apart combined, a tungsten piece was fused anew, and from that curiosity, a new series was born. I wasn't quite sure what I was doing, but an excitement told me to keep going. A defiance told me I didn't care, that I didn't even know what to call it, other than what it was, surreal fashion, a story in one frame. The model, the basis of a standalone piece, different, timeless, surreal. Could I make more? Could I, should I, strategize surprises like this? 
Could I make some actual directed success of this venture? Could Matthew be my left brain whilst I'm, I'm at the helm of the right? We seem to make the perfect team, going forward to plan out the spontaneous, he producing, I suffusing the soul into the final canvas. I would take more paintings and inject them directly into a new contemporary context. The same passions of my self-portraiture were there. Places, femininity, surrealism, desire for a better world, this time calling on an opulent world, femininity of fashion, and now with the help of a team, turning that into surrealism, fine art fashion. A hybrid genre might sound sexy, but the reality does bring frustration. Images that are too fine art for fashion and too fashion for fine art mean missing recognition in either genre. Following your curiosity doesn't bring all rewards, or at least within the time scale that you impose. This image got the balance right. A single canary taken from a 19th century painting by Jean-Baptiste Gruz and multiplied over a tool dress bulging from the cage of a spiral staircase to become a colorful flock, transforming a fashion model into something art collectors wanted to hang on their walls. These were dresses as my canvas. A red siren calling over the sea was to become a poignant memory edited during the saddest time of my life that followed. Back from LA, living the dream, at 32 weeks, Matt and I learned our first baby wouldn't survive beyond my body. Our world stood still while we shook and sweated for a fortnight. To a decision to carry our baby to term, a home birth, something I'd long planned, was still our perfect conclusion. At 43 weeks, mid-December, Evan was peacefully stillborn in my bedroom. Surreal because it felt like a victory, an event of awful sadness and yet also incredible spiritual privilege to carry a little person who showed us our own strength. But wounded deep down, we were grieving parents, jilted by nature's hand. That Christmas was cancelled, and in defiance, we piled high the calendar for the new year. 2014 was set to be crazy. Seattle, France, Germany, Bulgaria, New York, and Iceland. We dreamt up a vision of traveling around Iceland, of all places, somewhere we'd never been but wanted to plan an Arctic adventure, hiring the bravest models we knew for what we called extreme fashion. For location-loving photographers, this was the ultimate. An experience we'd never quite had anywhere. Conditions we'd never had the challenge of before. Our robust Nikons soaked and blown for the reward of the amazing images that resulted. The beauty of prehistoric textures, geometry of the landscape. For me, it wasn't about applying Photoshop here, nothing to mask what was already magnificent in-camera surrealism. A model in a dress amongst those scenes was surreal in itself, a vision that would surprise and intrigue passing tourists. Twice we explored Iceland that year, truly memorable, not just for what we created, but for the feelings of fear that we pushed through to plan and execute our ambitious trips. With 10 other photographers, 10 crew, and our Viking guides taking us from lagoon to lava fields, snow-filled caves, geysers, waterfalls, and basalt cliffs, tranquil lakes, rough seas, to melancholic beaches. I, a grieving mother, managing a smile for the future, not knowing if we could even have healthy children. The chill gave us a buzz yet for more adventure, a desire to live our dream no matter what. An ice cave we all nerve-wrackingly crawled into with our cameras and clothes and strobes, a cave that now only exists in this photo. And then, back in England, we turned our hand to advertising, shooting an extraordinary Nikon campaign, a white witch awakening animals from their spell. I'd like to take you into a special video of this shoot, which for us is still a perfect promo, a beauti beautifully cinematic portrayal of what was a magical shoot for us that year, made by Beyond Content UK, that still gives me goosebumps and gratitude to watch. I call myself a fine art and fashion photographer and I feel like I'm not too much one or the other because fine art for me is my origin and the lens through which I look at fashion and it's my way of being able to carve a vision of something that comes from a part of my mind that is interested in story, that is interested in imagination. When I first started taking pictures, what interested me the most were exciting things, colour, outfit, locations, and it was very subconscious at times, like I would notice like a parallel between shapes in the composition. So it's a weird one, because out of all the photography genres, fashion is the most contrived and one that takes the most effort, the most production, and so you have to 
boil all those ingredients down to something that looks very effortless. And it's a craft, it's an art that I'm still discovering with more and more fascination as I go on. I Know Park is this amazing house in the middle of Oxfordshire in the United Kingdom and it's full of all these works of art, taxidermy and props, all very eccentric related to British culture and we're shooting a concept of the White Witch Awakening and in these images we're conveying this narrative of the model who is this white witch unlocking animals from a spell and we've got images where she's also playing with shadows and playing with props around the very surreal location that we're shooting in here. I think being a photographer is like conducting an orchestra or directing a movie. You've got all these moving parts that you have to capture the best glimpse of everything. So the final picture here is all in camera. Um, literally, this was our no Photoshop brief. So the zebra handler is actually hiding behind the polar bear. Um, and we're all just like straining back, he just heaving, um, literally a massive group of us all working on this image. Um, so yeah, it was a great challenge for us because we love Photoshop, but this was um, also a little bit of a, uh, something that showed us what we could do without Photoshop as well. This assignment for me, it, it was a milestone. Our picture on the Hong Kong Metro, for the first time, I actually felt like a real photographer. And though it was commercial work that made me feel validated, it was that which showed us that what everything we do, the basis is fine art. It's fine art, our eccentric vision, this white witch became a sought after art piece, a benchmark bestseller. The zebra I smiled to myself for me was our dear son Evan, a rare, exotic, unpredictable, wild animal that life is, and you go on regardless. And amidst our reg regular feelings of career confusion, we held on to the knowledge that in everything, personal and professional, it was our autonomy, our passion that seemed to guide us. Our best client was us. A journey led by the heart, terrifyingly reassuring. Hungry for more commercial briefs that allowed for an artist remit, London restaurants commissioned me to make large-scale surreal art. This time it was faces filled with old paintings, kai face shot on medium format, eyes shot in even greater detail, and then filled with ancient Chinese paintings to tell a story in one gaze. And then more faces, bloom face, coal shed face, more large-scale pieces of work filled digitally with art history, huge modern-day tapestries painstakingly weaved on a computer screen, full of life, death, everything, remixing centuries of artists to produce a new vision, bringing me back to being a child, filling a paper with tiny doodles. Instead of days in Photoshop, it was months, and a trial of perseverance paid off. Having a picture in the window of a Michelin star Mayfair restaurant seemed a better advert than all the gallery shows I'd had. And that special crazy 2014 brought yet another gift. The following spring, a pink and pudgy gurgling girl, born this time in the living room, powerfully, joyfully. We were parents again, yet anew. My past bitterness extinguished by the happiness of a child that was here to stay. And you've probably seen running around the last few days. <laughs> With new little Lilith in tow, we continued our creative adventures, building our collection of surreal fashion images, deepening a love affair with English stately homes and taxidermy, French chateaus, American mansions, and European houses that we, from our humble working class origins, would never have otherwise had the opportunity to access. Going to places all over the world on our own initiative, inviting other photographers to collaboratively fund these decadent and beautiful productions, commissioning bespoke dresses, making our own dresses, putting it all together with the best talent we knew into the dreamiest locations we could find. Inspired by families who were living the dream, we wanted to keep going with our own, sometimes incorporating paintings, sometimes incorporating stock imagery, and sometimes using nothing but the location itself, whatever felt right for a surreal fashion vision. The series has become popular with art buyers worldwide. We make limited edition prints of every image, small, XXL, 14 pieces, 14 pieces purchased by the Quillon Hotel in Paris, so featured, featured twice on Saatchi Art and exhibited at the Saatchi Gallery itself. Vogue Italia, luxury ships, hotels, attracting agencies and media worldwide. It's opened up a new audience. 
Valuation, validation undoubtedly encourages, facilitates the creation of more money as applause, the fuel to the cogs to keep turning. But a series also needs dedication and commitment to keep going beyond the first strokes of curiosity, marketing it long after the honeymoon period. Pictures aren't enough for the art world. They want words, backstories, statements. And so I crave seeing a deeper dialogue of meaning, authority of intellectualization, some which came with the honor of this, having my work hung in the Val de Chamoud, Swedish Museum, a show called Salons Mallory, curated by Anna Meister last year. My work hung as a contemporary commentary alongside 18th and 19th century salon painting. The parallels between them were fascinating. I was invited to open the exhibition and speak about the nature of paintings and photos, the crossovers, the overlaps. It was the most special exhibition I'd had. Not only did I feel that my work was valued, but I felt it was a milestone for modern digital fine art photographers everywhere, our work accepted into a chronology of art history. Our images have also awoken new desires within ourselves to take it to the next level. CGI, special effects and moving image. Matt and I, always inquisitive like children, craving the next thing, moving on and on, sometimes to the disorientation of a world that wants a simple full stop. I could end my talk here with the success of surreal fashion, except it would only be half my story. This event is about curiosity and fear. Curiosity could also be interchangeable with boredom. Boredom with my student life led to self-portraiture and quitting my first job to pursue it. Boredom with its limitations led to surreal fashion. Each change has risked the accumulation of the name I accrued up to then, not wanting to be stuck in a box. Now it's boredom again, with limitations, with dead ends, with forever waiting and waiting on people, and overdose on conventional beauty and superficiality has led to the taking of a new risk. But also the chance of the biggest fulfillment I could dream of, the first time in my life I put my mind into my work. And the greatest thing that ever happened to me into my work. When I'd gaze in admiration at the work of famous photographers, I'd realize that amidst my admiration, there was something missing, only a sliver of womanhood portrayed, sexed up or broken, anything more on maternal seemed token, and what I've experienced is screaming to be spoken. Again, those motifs, those ingredients, this time raw and purposeful, places, femininity, surrealism, desire for a better world, this time with profundity, because for this surreal fashion loving photographer, the surrealism comes from the most real thing. A topic both amazing and ordinary, personal and universal and graphic in a way that might make it seem at odds with everything I've ever done. Birth, for me, was a positive experience, both times, loss and rainbow. I look back on both of them with joy, sometimes confusing the two. My wishes and instincts were respected and I wanted that for all women in all births. I was sad to find that default we lack, a joyful baseline for all women's birth. One thing the world can agree on is the importance of love and human connection in all things. They say peace on earth begins with birth. Could an art series help affect change? This event encourages me to think yes. Birth Undisturbed is a series that uses my story to tell 12 stories to hopefully affect real women's stories yet to happen, selecting from our resources to create a focused photo series, but more than a series, a voice, a message, a movement, bringing to life figureheads in history, women famous, obscure, and imaginary. Right now, you are witnessing my next moment of curiosity. I want to usher into art a maternal, feminine, revolutionary, maybe, vision, images I haven't seen, a voice I haven't heard, a massive gap. I want to fill with bold, unforgettable images. I feel like I know now confidently who I am as an artist. Especially for you for the first time, I would like to show you an excerpt from the new series, Birth Undisturbed. Here, it's a passage from a book that called me to make it into a picture. A historic moment where a doctor is fascinated by a nameless woman in 1911. This is part of a series of work that is giving me the greatest fulfillment of curiosity, fear, and the biggest creative high I think I've ever known. Storytelling in a way I haven't done before. So I give you this trailer called The White Chapel Woman. We're going back a hundred years. The young Dr. Grantley Dick Reed is being called to a poor woman in a squalid bedroom in the East End of London who's in labour. 
He offers chloroform to her, but she refuses, and afterwards, when he asks about it, she replies with a line that he'll never forget. I'm drawn to the passage in this book because it has such a cinematic visual quality that calls to me as a photographer to recreate it almost prescriptively. Using lights and gels to create the look of an old tungsten lit oil painting. These are amber key lights, you can see they're slightly frosted. Dick Reed's book, Childbirth Without Fear, was the first book that I ever read on this topic before I ever got pregnant. Just one of many great childbirth figureheads going against the grain. It's his fascination with her and the work he goes on to do for generations to come. Part of the reason I've made it is also because we've got much further to go. We have a crisis here in the UK at the moment that goes against everything that Dick Reed worked his life to put out there. We need to rebalance the power dynamic in childbirth. This was made by the same guys who made the zebra video, uh, the Nikon video you saw earlier. There's immense feeling of power for me, commissioning my own voice to tell these stories. This series is in the making right now, and it's a project that, like everything I've ever done, I'll be sharing through social media, this time a little bit differently. Social media has always been intimately a part of my story, right from those first self-portraits. The audience has always been almost an ingredient in the shaping. And now it's me, uh, it's Instagram that I use, almost like a journal, to invite you to witness and even be part, so please join me there. I'd like to end by thanking Harris and everyone at Story for inviting me and my family to be here, and to Matt Nisley for making this come about. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Thank you.